Hello, everyone. We are live. Um, good morning. If Hello. You're in Australia. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Kevin. So good Hi, to Amy. be here and go live with you. Um, everyone, this is Kevin from Monkey Abroad. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself and your channel? Oh, whoa. Jeez. <laughs> Sorry, I heard our audio on my computer. Always, I'm going to close it. Uh, hello, everyone. It always um, yeah, so hello everyone on Amy's channel who's never heard of me. My name is Kevin Cook. I have the channel Monkey Abroad. <laughs> I lived in China for a while. I've studied Chinese. And uh, Amy, please introduce yourself to people on my channel. Oh, yes. Hello everyone watching on Monkey Abroad's channel. I'm Amy. I make travel content about China. Um, I love eating. That's also a main focus of my channel. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> nice. Well, it's great to do this live yeah, stream with so, you. Yes, it is. I've been wanting to do um, a crossover for a while and, yeah, get to know you a little bit more. Um, we've got a very, very exciting live stream planned for everyone and we're going to be basically talking about um, our different experiences when it comes to learning Chinese because we both have very different paths and we'll go into that. But I thought before we get into the meaty stuff, um, if we do some get to know you questions, because um, I guess my audience may not know you very well and your audience may not know me very well, very well. And also maybe we don't know each other very well yet. So um, let's play a little game of mm. get to know you. Kevin, where are you originally from? Hey, I'm originally from Dallas, Texas, here in the United States. How about you? Where are you from? Mm. I am from Australia, from Sydney, where I currently am right now. Due to uh, travel ban reasons, I have come home to Sydney and I'm living with my parents. And uh, yeah, I'm just grateful that they haven't converted my room into a home gym or <laughs> something yet. So I still have a, my own room here. Um, yeah, I'm originally from Sydney. Um, question number two, why did you first come to China? Uh, I first came to China, funny story, because the girl that I was dating for a couple of years in university, her major was mm. Eastern Studies and Chinese Language, and I was kind of <laughs> bumming around in a fraternity, and she sort of introduced me to Chinese language and culture, and uh, even though we broke up, I still That's decided, great. you know, I, I'm fascinated with China, so I went over there. And, uh, That's how about so you? funny because I asked Andrew the same question in a live stream about a week ago, and he says that the reason that he started Chinese is because of a girl in Paris. Um, oh yeah! So it seems that for many guys, girls are the reason you want to start Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> but but don't think of it in the way that uh, you could interpret that. Like you're just going to China for Chinese women or something. It's the girl that I was dating was a western girl studying chinese okay so uh and i think well, that, and Quager, I he's he's the parisian girl <laughs> yeah so okay all right so there's a couple of ways you could interpret these stories and uh i want to get the record straight <laughs> <laughs> so how about you okay, tell me the record, tell me your kind of the tale. record. Yeah. <laughs> oh my tale i originally went to china to be an exchange student um, and I started Chinese, uh, studying Chinese when I was at university in Australia. And then I went over to China as an exchange student for a year and decided I really loved it. And then um, when I had the opportunity after graduating, I went back and did an intensive language program in Beijing. And then pretty much since then, um, 2017, I've been traveling nonstop um, in China and around the world. So yeah, that's my little story. Um, and hopefully I can get back to China as soon as possible. <laughs> right now it's not looking too good in terms of um, border closures. Um, I'm Australia isn't letting me leave. China isn't currently accepting foreign uh, travel and visitors. So, yeah. Oh, well, having fun here in Australia and glad to be with family. Um, oh. I guess that answers kind of this question. Where am I based now? I am currently in Sydney, Australia. Uh, Kevin, what about you? Uh, currently, I'm in Florida. My uh, This is where my mom has a house. So, yeah, not my hometown, but it still feels like home here because there's family. Yeah. Where would you be if you didn't have to be home right now? Uh, almost no doubt I'd be somewhere in China. 
probably based in yeah. Guilin, um, uh, traveling Ooh. sometimes, but yeah, uh, probably doing some work somewhere in China. Nice. Yeah. And you probably could say the same oh, exact cool. thing. That sounds nice. Yeah, I'd most probably be in China right now. Actually, I think I was meant to be in Yangshuo right now, um, studying Chinese, funnily enough. Uh, but yeah. yeah, you know, can always do that at a later date. Um, no. No, no biggie. Um, when and why did you start your YouTube channel, Kevin? Uh, you know, why don't you go first this time? I've gone first the last few questions. Okay. And, uh, I think it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> okay. When uh, I started my YouTube channel uh, a little over a year ago, uh, why did I start it? I was posting on Chinese social media for um, quite some years. And then I decided to start posting to YouTube what I had already posted on that Chinese social media. And yeah, and then really liked posting on YouTube. So yeah, I kept going. Nice. And you've grown yeah. steadily since then. Your channel has blown up and your following <laughs> is just, it seems like the most like positive group of people who are all interested in China and Chinese they language. Yeah, the yeah, the um I have a really lovely um audience which I'm really really thankful for. Um and I'm getting some comments actually that my my image is very blurry. Um <laughs> on the so I'm not sure what I should do whether I should try reconnect to my Wi-Fi. Um oh, yeah. so I'm going to go on to the next question and you answer this and if I drop out I'm just going to log back in. Um and just one okay. moment. So you're going to leave me here by myself? <laughs> potentially, there will be no me for um, for potentially 30 seconds. I'm just going to okay, turn no off problem. my hotspot. This, and then is, this will be a channel takeover. Time. Yeah. All right. Yes, here you go. Uh, I give you the floor. Okay. So, uh, all right, folks. <laughs> I guess I'm by myself. It's, I'm streaming on Amy's channel and my channel right now. And I'm just, you guys are a captive audience. I'm just going to tell you what I like to do for fun. I like to play chess. For those of you who play chess, I enjoy it. Uh, I like to exercise calisthenics, particularly. Sometimes I like to read novels. I enjoy classic literature. And, uh, you know, if I'm in China, I study Chinese. Don't worry, we won't bite. Okay, thanks, y'all. This is so cool, by the way. I'm really happy to be interacting with two audiences simultaneously. This is really awesome. Uh, this uh, software, StreamYard, will allow this. <laughs> okay, okay. So now there's. Okay, all right. You've replaced <laughs> yourself. <laughs> there's three. Yeah, I don't know. It came in and, uh, and there was already a blonde in China in the live stream. Is this any better? Um, yes. This, yeah? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's much better. Yeah, I wasn't, I didn't know if I should say anything. I was like, maybe only I see you as blurry, but yeah, it was like blurry. It was a little blurry. Yeah, no, I'm glad that I saw the comments about it. Um, usually I would um, avoid my Wi-Fi because my Wi-Fi is terrible here. It takes me like hours to upload a video on YouTube. Um, wow. But yeah, I'm getting some comments saying um, my internet is way better. So please, um, in the comments, they keep me informed if it goes bad again and I will... Uh, try to get into the wiring. Okay, no, but so um, far, so good. Oh, good, excellent. Okay, happy to hear that. Um, did I miss anything exciting while I was away? <laughs> oh, like pretty much all your followers were like, I should be the one, I should be Blondie in China. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you just, one thing, you have to dye your hair blonde. Oh yeah, true, fuck. All right, you know what, Never mind. back, it's your channel again. <laughs> Well, you know, this is going live on both of our channels, so I am pl merely playing the part of host um, in and asking the questions. <laughs> um, okay, this is a fun question. What did you want to be when you were a kid? Do you want me to answer this first, or do you want to do you want to go? Uh, you know what? I'll I'll go ahead and answer this one. Uh, I wanted to be a cartoonist, and that's so cool. Yep, and uh, particularly a monkey cartoonist. That's why the channel is called Monkey Abroad, by the way. I used to draw monkeys all the time. So, oh, yeah. that's so cool. Yeah. Do How you have you? any uh, cartoons readily available that we can check out? Or uh, are they all open? I mean, I, I do. I have like a, a book of comics, uh, but it's in the other room. I don't want to have to okay. go pick it up. But 
Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I believe you. I'm, <laughs> for it's me, like, I, I don't want to see your comics, please. <laughs> um, so for me, I wanted to be a teacher. When I was a little kid, I used to um, line up all of my toys on the bed and I would read them storybooks and just random magazines. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and now I'm here as some kind of, I guess, YouTuber. Uh, <laughs> a weird turn of event. Um, here's, here's a fun one. Our plans for the future. I'm interested to hear what uh, your plans are after a coronavirus. What what are you gonna What are you gonna get up to? Oh man, I wish I could say I have no idea. I am just completely, completely unsure of my future right now. Yeah. Oh, so do you think you want to go back to China, or you don't even know that, or? Yeah, I do want to go back, but you know, if things take too long, it's you got to make moves elsewhere. You know. Yeah. So, do you think potentially having a base in the states moving forward? We'll see. We'll see. Maybe make some content here. You know, if things open up. But um, yeah. yeah. How about you? What's what's the uh, what's your plan coming up here? So I am a planner. So I could probably go on for like twenty minutes about my plans. <laughs> um, so, so my plans. My plan is. Um, make content from here as uh, for as long as I am here. And I'm learning more and more that there are a lot of content opportunities here in Sydney. We have a really amazing array of Chinese food, um, a lot of different centres of, you know, different areas where I can go to eat that, a lot of um, content creators I've been meeting up with here in Sydney. So I keep doing that um, while I'm here. And then as soon as I can travel again, I'll be going back to China to make some, to do some more videos and projects. And then hopefully next year I'll be based in Beijing. Uh, I have a job offer kind of waiting for me. I don't know what the situation is on that and whether that will have changed um, since the whole situation going on but um yeah hopefully i can be based over there as a full-time travel reporter but yeah wow. just gonna go low life takes some weird turns but for now i'm hoping and angling myself towards that aim um yeah that's, that sounds that's awesome cool. yeah you total you would kill it at that job I would love it because I um, I love what I do so much. I love making videos and I love making more like documentary style videos and having, uh, you know, yeah, I really love doing that. And it would mean I can do that on a full-time basis but also have some stability. Um, yeah, as you can probably relate in this kind of job field, there isn't much stability. I have been living out of a suitcase for the last three years and it would be nice to have, you know, my own place an apartment. Uh, I'm hoping I can live in one of those cute hutong houses in um, in Beijing. Uh, a fellow YouTuber, Nico, who's living in Beijing, actually has a an agent that she's already like sent me his WeChat. <laughs> so, Dang. yeah, yeah, I have plans. You know, You're a our planner. Agent, the hutong housing agent at my disposal on my WeChat. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I don't even know I'm gonna what I'm gonna eat for dinner tonight. Yeah, no, I, I think um, it's just some, some way I've always been. I've I've always been a planner. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, good for Can't, you. Which, which makes times of uncertainty, like right now, a little bit stressful because all my plans are like not coming to fruition and I have no way to get those plans done and make plans. But, you know, it's a good exercise in just relaxing a little bit. Um, yeah, a little yeah. bit of chaos in your life. Yes, exactly. I just got a comment here in the live chat saying, uh, when you get your own place in Beijing, please do a house tour. Um, I will definitely, definitely do that. If I do finally make a move to Beijing and get like a residency and um, I will be documenting the whole process because it's something that I'm not <clears throat> too sure about. Um, I've never moved to China for a specific job and I'm sure there are a lot of people with questions about that. So yeah. Um, that is those are my plans for the future long story short um that's the end of our get to know you rapid fire question round um i feel like i know more about you now kevin um definitely yeah i know more about you too and i also know that you're a whiz with these live streams like you had these things popping up here and there and i'm like barely figuring out how to do this right now so i'm impressed Oh, thank you. Well, it's pretty simple on the back end here. And now that I've done a few, um, so I've got 
I've got like the thing to press. The first time I did it, I was like, oh, how do I press the things? But now I'm quite good at doing the pressing. Um, thank you to Simon for your super chat and thank you for your well wishes. That's really, really kind of you. Yeah, thanks, Simon. So where's my, can I get $3 too? Or how's that work? Like, so you're you just going to give me, tables. No, it's, you're just going to give me a half your super chat. That's cool. Okay, All right, I'll, so it's settled. I'll waste you by game. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Um, so um, I think let's move on to the chunky, exciting part of our live stream today. Um, and if, people are just tuning in right now um the topic we'll be discussing today is studying chinese in china and um i think it could be cool if we give like a very brief overview of what our path has been um because we come from very different learning backgrounds so i went through the traditional university route i went on exchange and was there as an exchange student and then i went back and did an intensive language program learning you know in that in that environment and learning in more of that, um, yeah, uh, what, how do I even explain it? Like conventional classes, university, no. Chinese university experience. Um, but for yourself, Kevin, can you explain how you went about it? All right, I'll explain. I got a co comment down here. I already hate that guy. All right, Rizzo, you know what? I'm going to tell you my experience. <laughs> Someone who already hates me. Someone who's already made up their mind about me. <laughs> Rizzo. So, all right, I moved to China <laughs> and I was, I was just aimless. I had no idea what was going on. And I got a job teaching at a university. I could only count to 10 in Chinese, uh, but I was living in like a really rural area of Shandong. And after yeah. living there for a year, um, I did pick up quite a bit of Chinese uh, kind of through necessity. And then after yeah. that, I moved to Shanghai where I, uh, I met a lot more foreigners who couldn't speak any Chinese. And I realized that if I'm gonna stay here, I'm I'm way too competitive. I'm not gonna sort of let myself get lumped with these foreigners who sort of all stick together. I'm gonna learn Chinese. Yeah. And so that's when I really started going to tutoring and going to private schools. And uh, I never went to university, but um, I just did lots of tutoring. And over the years, it really added up. And so that's how I kind of learned. Awesome. Oh, cool. So, yeah, I guess in general, you're kind of going your own way with um, learning by osmosis from your environment. And I kind of went about learning through that traditional classes um, and university. So a bit of a different background on that. Um, so, yeah, let's, I have some different comparison questions here. Okay, so I thought maybe we could compare first the, like, the pros and cons of taking classes in general to learning from environment. So this could be taking classes in university or in a private college or whatever um, compared to learning from your environment um, and by osmosis. So um, I, I would ha say like there's definitely um, pros and cons to both. For me, taking classes was really important in the beginning to get a good foundation and to learn some of those um, building blocks for learning the language further. Um, but then the fluency and being able to feel comfortable in the language came from being based in China and my interactions with um, Chinese people and my Chinese friends and just being there every day and surrounded by it. So I think that a combination of the two is nice. But, um, you know, taking classes, you're definitely learning words that you probably don't need and mm -hmm. um, learning phrases <clears throat> that no one really uses and, you know, when you're taking classes, you kind of, you're learning, but then you leave the classroom and you kind of stop learning. Um, what are your views on that, Evan? Yeah, you're totally right. Like you learn a lot of archaic vocabulary inside the classroom. Um, but yeah. I mean, most of it is useful. So, uh, and you never really know when you're picking up those kind of older words until you have a Chinese friend who's like, no one talks that way. And yeah, you yeah. pick up your internet slang and like just how the kids talk, you know, when you're hanging out with your Chinese yeah. friends. So yeah, you need that's both. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I learned the most amount of Chinese um, when I was living with my Chinese friends and I had Chinese roommates um, because every day was speaking Chinese and you're learning the koyu, the slang, and um, yeah, my Chinese was never more on point than it was uh, in those six months that I was living with them. Uh, so yeah. 
merits to both, I guess. Um, Absolutely. So now maybe we can compare like more specifically um, university classes versus going to private colleges versus self-study. Because I know that you went through a lot of private colleges to learn Chinese. I have never done that. I've only really ever learned Chinese. Actually, now that I think about it, the only times I've formally been learning Chinese has been either in the university class or through self-study. Um, and so can I first get your opinion on what it's like learning at a private college in China? Yeah. So, I mean, I imagine it's when you're inside the classroom, probably the biggest, yeah. the biggest difference would be the class size. Yeah. Uh, in a private school, there's like the school I went to at most the class was like three students. It was amazing. Yeah. Like, and we met for three hours a day, five days a week. And so it, it was almost like private tutoring. And if you do that for a few months, it just yeah. like really, and if you're studying for a few hours on top of that every day, it's just yeah. like this intensive matrix, like, oh, you're absorbing the Chinese language. It's so fun. Yeah. I love that experience. Yeah. And um, I, I've heard though from people that studied in university, um, yeah. particularly the larger ones that like, uh, you're mixed in with all different races and sometimes mm. other groups that are studying Chinese, like Korean students, for example, would excel compared to Western yeah. students. Did you ever experience anything like that? I know it's a well, specific question. Well, yeah, definitely. I feel that, um, Korean and Japanese students were really good at Chinese language. I think because they have a bit of a background, um, I think there are some similarities in the languages. I'm saying yeah. they're the same. You know, there are some uh, characters. Especially with Japanese, yeah, for sure. Are the same. So they tended to learn a lot faster. But, um, yeah, um, at the end of the day, I guess, I never saw it as a competitive kind of environment because I was just learning at my own pace. They were learning at their pace. As long as I could, like, keep up and learn something from the coursework, I was fine with that. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, in learning at a university, in university classes, um, it's a really great social environment, um, really easy to make friends. I love the structure of, you know, you know, you live next door and you go to class and that's your daily routine. There's no other distractions, um, especially when it came to the intensive language program, which I'll go into um, in a little bit about my experiences with that extensive, um, in, intensive language program. But yeah, I for the I really enjoyed my time um, doing the university classes in general. But there, are, you know, um, I would say that uh, yeah, when you're learning in that environment, there are some things. I remember we did one lesson and we were learning some really random words that I'm sure I'll never have to use in my life. Like one word that just sticks with me is to push. Like we learned the characters to push ducks in through a gate with a stick there's is that, a specific character for that and i was like when am i ever going to use this um it sounds yeah. like an idiom you know like it that sounds like it should be an idiom not like a, a useful phrase. yeah it wasn't even and i was like and so there were times like that where i was thinking if i was just you know doing it my own on my own i wouldn't be spending the time memorizing words like this because when you have dictations you have to know the words so you have to study them um yeah. I just got a super chat from Boltsy Blee. Um, and so I'll just answer this quickly. Um, do you think fewer Australians will have interest in Chinese language after the pandemic? There, there's a lot of a lot of um racial tension um at the moment between Australia and China, which is really, really sad to hear. Um, and I think, yeah, maybe probably there will be less Australians studying Chinese after the pandemic, unfortunately. So I'm hoping that with my channel, I can show people that, you know, there's a side to China that you don't know and that you're not seeing on the news and that it's um, uh, something that is worth studying for your own interest or working there one day or just learning more about the culture, which is regardless of anything is fascinating. It's a really interesting place. So hopefully there will be um, people that are still interested in going to China and learning about the culture after all this is over. Um, but yeah. Anyway, back to our uh, our questions. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, so self-study. Um, self how, would you, how would you compare, say, for example, self-study to your private colleges? Uh, 
I mean, th there's almost no comparison. You, no matter what you're doing, you have to do self study, whether you're university, whether you don't have any teacher at all. But yeah, but like, if you're if you're going to class, yeah, which is essential. Uh, I feel like it's impossible to learn Chinese unless you have a formal teaching, uh, like a teacher somehow, like a formal teacher student relationship, whether it's a tutor or university or a private school. I feel like that's absolutely necessary, but. I feel yeah. like they really only point you in the right direction or there's like a phrase like the teacher shows you the door you have to be yeah. the one to walk through it and as long as you have a teacher kind of correcting you every now and then self study yeah. is essential so you, you just you need all of it you know you can't yeah. just self study yeah 100% yeah that's really that's really true i think it's good to have a good rounded experience um yeah, and definitely whatever you're doing and however you're learning, having the environment as well just makes everything a lot easier and a lot more easy to understand everything. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to give a little overview of what it was like studying in a Chinese university because I don't know, there might be some people watching that are maybe interested in um, applying for exchange or they're thinking about um, maybe studying in China an intensive language program at some stage. Um, it was so much fun um, studying at a Chinese university and the advantage of studying at a Chinese university as a, as a language student is you can pretty much go to any university. It's very easy to get into. Um, I went to Fudan University in Shanghai and Tsinghua University in Beijing, which are two of the best universities in China. But the thing is that I never had to pass a test um, it wasn't hard to get into because I'm going there to study Chinese. So you have the advantage of being able to study at some of the best universities in China on some of the most beautiful campuses in China. And it was really an awesome experience, but because you're studying, going there to study language, it's very easy to get in. So um, I really enjoyed that. And yeah, when, um, yeah, I really liked um, having, you know, just living right next to my classes and being able to walk to school. Um, I really, yeah, so I really enjoyed it. And I also wanted to go into more um, detail on what an intensive language program is. Um, it's basically um, you sign up for a, this intensive language program. It can be a six months, like one semester or a one year program. I did the one year one. And basically you have Chinese lessons every day. Um, I think it's four to five hours a day. And um, when I was doing it at Tsinghua, we had um, different subjects for different parts of Chinese. So we had um, a Koyu class, we had a listening class, we had a reading class, we had a writing class. So for the different areas of the language, we would study it every day. And, you know, a lot of that was really great because never in my life have I spent so much time like sitting down, learning the language so intensely. But there was a disadvantage with it in the fact that you, all your friends are Western, um, or, or, sorry, all your friends are not, in your program are not Chinese. You're not studying with other Chinese students because obviously Chinese students don't need to learn how to speak Chinese. Um, mm. So the problem is all your friends, as soon as you leave the classroom, you're most likely gonna be speaking English or whatever your um, home, your more comfortable mother tongue is. So you kind of like two steps forward, one step back, learning all of this stuff in the classroom. And then you go and party with your friends and you kind of, the next day you go back to class and you're like, oh yeah, what were we, what were we doing again? So um, the way that I tried to combat that in my second semester was stop associating with the, the foreign crowd and go make Chinese friends, um, which was the best decision I ever made because they're to this day some of my best friends in the world. Um, but yeah, so that's um, for people who are interested in um, an intensive language program, that is what it is. I might answer some questions from the chat now. Um, if there's anything, is it easy? to make Chinese friends if you go to language program in the university? I would say in general, no. Um, you really have to go out on your own to do that because even the area where the Chinese language classes were were compl almost separated from the rest of the campus. So if you wanted to make Chinese friends, you kind of had to um, do a, a um, an extracurricular activity, um, like join a tennis team or the badminton squad. Um, for me, I, I studied martial arts and that's how I made my friends. Um, and I did that off campus. So, uh, yeah, that's the so way. Are so you I'm, a black belt or? No, 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 I'm not good at all. I don't think I was ever good. Um, 
I studied Wing Chun for a couple of years in Sydney before I went to China. And then when I went to China, I studied at a martial arts academy for actors. So I was learning how to do like scissor kicks in the flying and then like backflips and all the fun things that they want to have on film because I had this like <laughs> weird delusion that I would be a Kung Fu superstar one day. Um, so you can really intimidate to- people though. You don't need to necessarily kick their ass, but you could look like you can kick yeah, no, their no, ass. No, no, no. I'll be the one standing there doing this and then they just run away. Like, um, yeah, stunned. Like, I backflip. Like, you better be scared. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was really, really fun. Have you ever done any martial arts in China, Kevin? Uh, in China, I did, uh, what is it? Oh, I forgot the name of it. My friends are going to kick my ass. Uh, I went to a class once in Shanghai. I did Taekwondo, though, Korean martial arts, w- way before, like, years ago. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, now that I'm back in Sydney, I really want to get into back into some kind of martial arts. Um, I don't. I, I really want to do Wing Chun again, but the problem is I have to start from scratch. Like they were, I've forgotten everything, so it's just a, hmm. a bit annoying. Anyway, um, over to you, Kevin. I want to know everything about what it's like to study at a private language college in China. I want to know, like, what are the hours like? What's the price of doing that? Um, Tell me everything. Okay. All right. I'll tell you everything I know. We, uh, it it totally depends on the program you sign up for. There, at least the schools that I went to, I'll I'll pick one in particular. Uh, The one I was uh, most recently called Omeda in Yangshua, uh, (laughs) a beautiful area of China. Um, We, could either do this part-time program where you could study as little as like like three or four classes a week if you wanted, or you could do the intensive, which is like 30 hours a week. Uh, so yeah. really, but I think most people did what's the standard course, 15 hours a week, and you either had um, like three hours in the morning or three hours in the afternoon. Yeah. And, um, and then of course, you know, you do your homework, so you'd have a few more hours on top of that. But one thing I really liked about the the private school is, um, of course, you live really close to the campus. Really, you just walk to class. But yeah. the community there was so cool. Like, pe- just oh. it was just people of all ages from all around the world came together in this yeah. this town, and people who were really passionate about learning Chinese. And then the community yeah. that was there, the teachers, they were all so helpful in also wanting to hang out with us after class like the teachers would on it like because they're not much older than us or in fact just like the same age as us so it was a bunch of people that just hung out and we would do things like go exploring uh go mountain climbing we do rock climbing and stuff and you know we go to the yeah this is young shore and so like Oh man, you you said that you were gonna go to Yangshua, and I promise, like yeah. when you do eventually make your way out there, you're just gonna be like, man, yeah. what am I doing in other places in China? It's just so beautiful, and it feels yeah. so remote and kind of private. And but the community there is great, so it really you won't feel kind of isolated. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, there was there was just a great sense of community, and um, but again, that's this particular school. Uh, I yeah. studied at another private school in Shanghai called the Hutong School, and oh. it didn't have that same community kind of feel. Uh, yeah. It was a little more expensive, obviously, because it's in Shanghai. Um, but uh, I guess the price range, it's going to be a little more expensive than university, of course. Um, universities, a lot of time you can get scholarships. Um, I assume that you did some, you got some scholarship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My um, intensive language program was completely covered. Um, yeah. The cost of that was completely covered. And if you are out there watching this looking for a Chinese scholarship, um, two places I would recommend you go to is the Chinese government scholarship website. They give out a lot of scholarships every year. Um, and I most people I know that tried out for it got it. So it's good odds that you'll get it. Um, the way that I got my scholarship is the Confucius Institute scholarship. And I was a part of the Chinese bridge competition and that gave me a scholarship. Um, but yes, please continue, uh, Kevin. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's nothing like a scholarship available for 
uh, <laughs> for private schools, unless you're a blogger, sad to say, uh, oh. obviously, well, I mean, well, that's, come on, that's, that's what blogging, that's like blogging 101. You, you know, you don't do yeah. things often for money. You do it in exchange for yeah. what you would pay money for in the first place. So, you know, uh, you get some free classes or some discounted classes if you're a China related blogger. And so that's obviously an incentive uh, for someone like me to want to choose a school. But yeah. um, uh, all that aside, uh, the price is still, it's pretty steep, you know, so it, you've got to set aside close to like a thousand dollars a month for full-time classes. US? Yeah. But I mean, that's, you, we're also talking about accommodation and food oh. and, you know, it, so it's all, it's kind of all inclusive, but yeah, if you study for half a year, you know, it's going to set you back a few thousand dollars. But like, now you put it like that, it's in a college, so they pay for your accommodation and is your meals included in that as well? Like it's, I thought yeah. it was like a thousand dollars for just tuition itself, which seems crazy, but six months, $6,000 and you're learning in a good environment and exploring a new place. And, um, um, one thing you said earlier was that there wasn't as much of a community feel in Shanghai as there was in Yangshuo. So I, it kind of brings up me to a question that was kind of down the list a bit, but there's also been someone here that had asked the question, would you recommend us to study in a first tier or a second tier city? Mm. So um, I think this is a really interesting question. And I guess um, what you were talking about kind of feeds into this. Do you think that the reason that there was more of a community feel in Yangshuo is because it was like, more, it was less of a big modern city. It was kind of a little bit smaller. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just when you have less foreigners in a place, yeah. it, it's way more conducive to learning Chinese. And yeah. when I was living in Shanghai, just, just like all I have to do is open up WeChat and I'm like, oh, I can go to meet my friends and like no more Chinese today. But in a place like Yangshuo, you can just totally choose to put yourself among the Chinese yeah. community. And it's like, even when you're not in class or studying by yourself, you go out and about yeah. and it's just 100% Chinese all the time. And so I yeah. absolutely recommend, uh, I mean, four, five tier cities, if you can handle it. Uh, if, you, if your goal is to improve your Chinese, give yourself some time in those really small towns because I think that it'll take you yeah. out of your comfort zone, which is so important. Yeah, I would completely agree because when you're in those like small towns where there are no foreigners around, you really make your own community. Um, you don't have any distractions. You don't feel like you have to rely on your other friend that speaks English and you form your own group. Like you make your own friends, you make your own like ways of going out on Saturday night um, with locals. And it's it becomes really a really rewarding experience. Um, I would love to spend more time in that in that kind of environment. I've spent maybe at most a month in that kind of small town environment. But yeah, every time I come out of it, my Chinese always feels a lot a lot stronger um, because it's literally being practiced. Every time I open my mouth, you're speaking Chinese. Um, so my experience learning Chinese has mostly been in first tier cities, in big cities. So I studied for a year in Shanghai and studied for a year in Beijing and lived for an additional year in Beijing after that. So um, I definitely, like, I enjoyed it and every city has, you know, its own, um, advantages and you can still get that sense of a real Chinese environment in a big city because it is, you know, just move away from your, um, your foreign friends and live in a area that maybe is a little bit out of the city a bit. Um, but yeah, in general, there is a lot more foreigners in a big city like Shanghai or Beijing. And I probably would have pushed myself more um, language wise if I had chosen a second tier city. Um, would, do I regret that decision? No, because I enjoyed my time so much in a first, time, first tier city and I have a lot more time hopefully left in this life to explore more places and spend more time in those second, third tier cities. So um, yeah, I hope that this answers um, the question um, and it was a question we were going to answer anyway. So, um, good question. Thank you. Um, I just got a super chat from Subkey asking, curious if you have to live on campus. This was also one of the questions we were going to answer. Um, and maybe we just dive into it, um, into the question I had here. No. 
Um, living situation, dorm versus private accommodation. How's that for fancy? <laughs> um, so for me, um, you don't have to live on campus. In fact, like it's actually quite competitive to get a dorm. Um, you have to log in as soon as the applications open and hope that you actually get one of these positions. And I know a lot of friends that didn't get online in time or that, you know, they took a bit too much time over breakfast that morning and missed the sign up opportunity. Um, so <laughs> yeah, you don't have to live in a dorm. Um, uh, I liked it because it was, um, I like living on campus because in Australia, I live. I lived really far away from my university, so I spent all my time commuting on public transport, and not really getting into the social life of uni because I was always like on a bus. Um, so when I went to China and lived on campus, I felt like I was getting that you know college experience, and um, I really, really loved it. It was so much fun. But yeah, I also lived off campus for my second semester at Fudan University. I rented a place with a friend off campus and that was really fun and probably cheaper than the dorm would have cost us in the end. Um, but yeah, uh, what about yourself, Kevin? What what did you do for accommodation situation when you were studying at a private college? Do they have uh, dorms? Like, the I mean, they did, they did have dorms available, but I just went private. I was, yeah, no. I, you know, and by the time I was almost 30 years old, by the time I was at that school anyway. So I'm like, I, I don't want to be living with some other kid. You know, I want to be by myself. Mm, fair enough. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's, that's, that's pretty much all I got to say with that. Yeah. Um, well, then I may as well elaborate on the dorm situation um, that I experienced at um, both Fudan and at Tsinghua. So there are, you can get a private dorm uh, or you can get a, a two-person dorm, which like you live in one room, oh, sorry, you have like a shared space and you have your own little room each. So you do have privacy. And then the cheapest option is two beds in one room. So you're literally like together in one room. Um, yeah. I had, because I had a scholarship I got to go for a single room option, which was really uh, good. I've never actually lived in one room with another person before. Um, I know that in America, I think that's quite normal when you go to college and you you have like roommates, right? Uh, I yeah, people live in dorms. I, I lived in a fraternity, so that was kind of a, a, a kind of an exceptional thing. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So that's um. That's what dorms were like. And, um, yeah, I found it pretty comfortable. Um, it was a, a bit small, but I don't need a lot of space. And, yeah, I would recommend you live on campus. It's very social and nice, at least for your first semester. And then second semester, go and rent somewhere with friends and, yeah, party it up. Um, <laughs> so next question we can our tips for self-study. Um, Kevin, can I ask you, how do you self-study when you're not in China? Uh, lately, I've been so lazy about this. So what I'm going to tell you is not what I've lately been doing, but like what I know is effective. Um, yeah. So uh, it depends on what area you want to specifically improve because you really have to sort of pick one that you want to hone. And I think um, writing is just probably one of the funnest things. Um, just writing out the characters can be so relaxing. And mm. just copying sentences from Pleco, copying vocabulary is, yeah. it's almost like drawing. I love doing that. Um, but like for listening and speaking, I think is the hardest to practice by yourself. Because uh, mm. you you need someone to tell you if you're doing it incorrectly. But one thing I like is watching cartoons, Chinese cartoons, uh, like Xiang Yang, um, uh, La Bi Xiao Xin. These these cartoons are because they have uh, what I think is when I watch like a Chinese TV show, um, and I've got my criticisms about Chinese TV shows, uh, but Chinese TV shows they don't often speak that clearly, in my opinion. But cartoons always seem to enunciate things much more clearly than like an adult program would. And yeah. I, it's almost like just 
hyper exaggerated uh, for the sake of children. And I think that that's important for a second language yeah. learner, um, especially just for getting the, the right tones down and not necessarily like looking at, oh, this is a third tone character. Okay, the third tone, third tone. Like I, I would rather just hear it a hundred yeah. times in a sort of natural way so that I'm like, I don't even know what tone it is, but I know it should sound like this, you know? Yeah. So it just kind of sinks in. So I think that that's one great way to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and like reading those little Chinese novellas, like the uh, graded readers. Yeah. <laughs> those are great. Have you ever read a graded reader? No, I haven't, I have to say. I've read a Harry Potter. You read Harry Potter in Chinese? And Twilight. Holy cow. That's, yeah. that's like that's HSK good. 6 level stuff. It took me a really long time, and I every page you should see my the book I have. Um, it oh, has man. scribbles <laughs> on every page. Um, but like but you read the entire I, I, thing. Yeah, yeah. The first chapter is always the hardest um, because there are so many there's so many foreign vocab there. Like you need to learn oh, of yeah. course vampire blood sucking blood for that matter. Like um, yeah, all of this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that word. Um, um, and yeah, but then after the first chapter, you know, a lot of that formative vocab that's going to be used throughout the book and same with Harry Potter. Like once, you know, the names of the characters, sorting hat, magic wand, Voldemort. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's good fun. I would recommend it. it. I jumped in a bit early. Um, I was probably only just intermediate when I started reading Chinese books, but by doing it, I, feel like I pushed my reading a lot and improved wow. really quickly. That's yeah. incredible. That's really impressive. Like, I, I always, or, you know, it's not, <laughs> but still like I wouldn't have the patience. I always stuck to the, the, the yeah. kiddie pool, you know, I stuck yeah, to where yeah. it was really easy with my little toys here. You're over there like, in the deep end. Because for me, it was just more interesting content. Like I completely agree that Chinese cartoons are probably more, suited for my level but i just can't get into it like i need I know. you know a juicy romance plot or you know some <laughs> hardcore drama going on or a, something you know something that makes it a bit more um engaging to watch okay here's so, okay let me let me just tell you though here's my criticism with with uh some chinese tv programs it's hard for me to be into the program other than viewing it for the utility of learning yeah it's not okay. like like from a chinese perspective there's so many wonderful tv shows that hollywood produces and this is i guess like soft power and it's like almost yeah. you're watching the show because it's like wow there's there's a lot of like really amazing dialogue in this show or like there's some really interesting things being put on the table but um obviously for for things that we can't discuss here but like the way that the media is sort of so rounded out it doesn't it doesn't make for a lot of like really like wow like head turning content and so like whatever i'm watching is like okay this is a utility like i'm i'm watching this to learn not to be like oh i'm gonna have a great experience today you know what i mean i think you just haven't found the right tv show kevin um i feel <laughs> very uh, i feel very excited in chinese tv shows, and at the moment i've really been getting into it um but then again maybe we just have different tastes in what we classify as a good tv show um right. yeah you know i'll take a, a teenage <laughs> love story any day um you know <laughs> you're at school, yeah. who, who's popular who's not popular who's the, the, the oh the rich boy likes me oh <laughs> okay fair <laughs> yeah, enough um yeah, so for me, but I think it just depends on, like, what you like in a TV show. Because um, I can definitely appreciate that Chinese TV shows are very different to uh, US TV shows, for example. Um, I think it just takes a little bit of getting used to. And at the beginning, for me, watching TV shows definitely was more of a utility thing. It was like, okay, let's sit down, let's do our Chinese practice. But then, like, when you start watching it, it's like, oh, yeah, watch some Chinese TV. She's eating what him? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Will they be together? Like, has the cheating wife returned? Um, it's, <laughs> I really enjoy it. But I, again, it just depends on um, your personal, uh, what you like and don't like. Um, I'm just going to have a look in the chat here to see if there's any, uh, any interesting questions. Oh, Katie has asked, what are your favorite books about China? 
I just read a really great book about China called China in 10 Words. And um, yeah, I won't go into it what it's about, but um, if you're interested in learning more about China, especially during like the last 50 to 60 years, I would really suggest that one. Do you have any books that you enjoy about China, Kevin? Uh, I read, right when I first moved to China, I read Journey to the West, but the English Ooh. translation. And Interesting. That was, yeah, that was like, it was almost like reading a Superman comic before going to the US. It's like, you just see it everywhere. So I was so yeah. happy that I read that story. I need to do it eventually. Like pretty much every time I, I talk about reading in, in, in like a Chinese context, someone asked me, have you seen, um, have you read Monkey King? And I never have, I don't even know the story. So I think I should even just get on and watch the movie and just so I can have an idea of like the characters and everything. Cause it seems to be a very important show concept, like a story in China. So I need to, yeah. um, I need to look into that. Um, yeah, but talking of um, interesting content, have you seen the One Wandering Earth movie? It's no. a Chinese movie. Oh, it was it was really fascinating. It's a fa fascinating concept, and they it was really big a couple of years ago when it came out because it was a like it was touted to be one of the best Chinese movies ever made, and it was really big. And it's basically this concept where. Um, the, the sun is slowly expanding and will engulf the earth Earth at some point. So they need to move the earth to a new galaxy. So they basically spend like 10 years building jets on one side of the globe, like into the earth. And then, and then the earth becomes its own like space vehicle and it's like shot into <laughs> like but, but the earth is rotating. How is it going to... The rotation. There's no more rotation. One half of the globe is uh, permanently in darkness. And they have like this uh, wow. this light globe in front of the earth as it's traveling. Well, it's like a strong light that kind of brings some, it's a fascinating <laughs> concept. And um, yeah, it's worth a watch. Um, is this a movie? <laughs> it's a movie, yeah. I, okay. I, I saw it at the cinema. And actually, it's so hilarious. One of my best friends in China, probably my best friend in Beijing, his name is Saul. Um, he's he's um, from England. And he often does like little casting calls in in China, like does some few acting projects on the side. And he one day went to like do this project. He took some photos on it, you know, it was on his WeChat story. And we were like, oh yeah, like he's doing another one of those, like um, he's in the background of some movie. <laughs> his elbow popped in there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, he's in the Wandering Earth movie. He was like, like a an extra in, he was an extra. Like um in the okay. end, like all people from around the world come and help to like push the gate closed. And he's in that. And it, I was like, oh my goodness, like you're actually in a movie that I've seen. It was and to see him on the screen, I, he was on there for a good couple of seconds. Anyway. That's really cool. So probably not interesting to a lot of people. Um <laughs> Yeah, so it seems that a lot of people in the chat have also seen Wondering Earth movie. Um, cool. Let's go on to our next. What would a day in your life studying Chinese at a private college or self-studying look like? What 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 would that look like? Okay, like how how detailed are we talking here? Like what kind you of detail? Uh, you can get an idea of the kind of detail I would like. Yeah, give me all the juicy details. Okay, so a day in my life at Tsinghua University Intensive Language Program. I would wake up at 7 a.m. I would go to the dining hall, to get breakfast. Um, at Tsinghua, they have the most university canteens of any university, I think, in the world, or at least definitely in China. And so I picked okay. my favorite one to go to, um, and I would usually get two cobs of corn, and just take that to class and just be nibbling that. <laughs> <mind> that. <laughs> um, and then um, I would get into my first class that would start at 8 a.m. And then classes would go from 8 till 12. So four hours of classes. And then we would break break for lunch. And then a big group of us would go to a, uh, one of the canteens and get food. One canteen that we got, went to all the time had like five levels. And every level had like different foods. So you get delicious. more corn there. Oh, so much corn, S such great sweet potatoes as well. Every day for like a year, I ate a sweet potato. Um, 
Yeah, so that was, I, I miss university food so much. Um, and then in the afternoon, I would um, do some study, go to a cafe, um, memorize my vocab that I need for my dictation test the next day. And then in the evening, I'd go out with friends to eat dinner or go to the canteen to eat dinner or order why my uh, takeaway to my dorm room and just like watch some Netflix or TV. So that's a day, a, usual, a typical day in my life at um, in a, an intensive language program. So I guess you can use it as a, a reference for how you All right, cool. Dang, it's going to be tough to live up to the 20 cobs of corn every day, but all right, <laughs> let's see. I got a, so I, I wake up probably like at like 7.30 or so, I'd go get uh, like chong fen, one of like the local oh, dishes. Oh, yeah, or like yeah. or mi fen, one of those like guilin specialty dishes. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. also get a cup of coffee, there's a little cafe there. And um, I would do my homework in the morning. I had classes in the afternoon. So like I would just self-study, drink coffee, write my vocab, and uh, up until lunch, have lunch. Uh, sometimes in the canteen at school. Other times I'd go out uh, or other times I'd cook in my kitchen in my apartment. And then uh, class for two and a half, three hours in the afternoon. Then when class was over, I was like, all right, no more Chinese studies. Um, I would do something outside, uh, either go to the gym or go rock climbing. Um, a lot of people in that school and a lot of people in that community are really good rock climbers. So we'd go rock climbing. Uh, and then they had some bars. We'd, you know, sometimes go out for drinks. Uh, if I had class the next day, I wasn't going to have more than like two beers. But uh, yeah, go home and, uh, you know, just hang out at home, do some reading, uh, hang out on my yeah. computer, maybe make a video or something. And then the next day, back at it. Cool. That sounds nice, like a nice routine. Actually, yeah. someone in the chat is asking if I can ask you whether your discount code still works for Omega Academy. Of course it still works, but good luck getting to Omega Chinese Academy because, uh, yeah, China is not really that hospitable right now. Yeah, and uh, maybe next year I'll be studying at Omega and you can use my discount code. <laughs> <laughs> no. Everyone, listen. Especially people here on Amy, this is a perfect opportunity. If you're on Amy's channel, do not ever use her discount code. Use my code. <laughs> All right, glad we got no this out here. My audience is loyal. They will definitely use my code. <laughs> um, um, oh, we've got a um, another super chat from Suki. Thank you so much for that. Um, what is What was the most difficult thing culturally for it? Um, can I classify what is it? Yeah. Most difficult culturally? for us um i guess about learning chinese but yeah culturally I, about uh, did you have culture shock when you went to china for the first time kevin yeah for sure when i first moved there i was not ready for it at all and again like i wasn't going there with any chinese background so i was just like whoa this is crazy you know it was tough yeah so what was the first city you went to did you say it was shanghai um, it was called Rizhao, a really small city, two hours south of Qingdao. In, oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah. Shandong province. Yeah. It was I like. I would get culture shock in a smaller place. Like I went to Shanghai. It was my first stop and it's very international. And I feel like it kind of eased me into, um, Chinese life. Um, yeah. and then I could go and explore different places, but yeah, for sure. That sounds intense. Yeah. But that's kind of like, that's why I chose that place. Because I was yeah. like, if I go to this place, the experience yeah. itself will sort of overshadow any other expectation. Like, I'll just have to be in the moment. And it was really yeah. hard, honestly. I kind of regretted it at first. But after a year there, I was like, holy cow, I went to Shanghai. Wow. Like, I am already Chinese now. Like, this is perfect. Yeah. It So it really worked oh. out in the end. Yeah, no, that's really good. Um good advice actually i think yeah if you go to a smaller play city you will learn chinese faster um and uh so um subki has actually replied saying she meant for you so it's supposed to be what was the most difficult thing culturally for you um let me think about that do you have an answer to that on the top of your head um i mean uh probably honestly probably the, the language barrier at first i thought it would be uh, I thought it would be easier, but I was uh, I was overwhelmed for the first like month or so. Yeah. 
so uh, language I guess that yeah that is I guess um because I went straight to being an exchange student at university and surrounded by other English speakers I never had that sense of like being completely overwhelmed by language because um it wasn't like um I had no one to speak to and you know if I couldn't speak Chinese properly I could yeah so that would be super overwhelming um for me the most difficult thing culturally hmm I don't know I I I I I I would definitely say that I didn't feel any kind of culture shock when I first went first went to China I just really enjoyed like for, okay, first time, it's not culturally, but the thing I felt most difficult when I first went to China and when I was in um, I was in Shanghai and traveling around China for my first time that year, I got food poisoning like all the time Ooh, um, yeah. <laughs> because I didn't know what to avoid. And so I was eating, you know, um, stuff that my weak stomach uh, probably shouldn't be eating um, when, before it had toughened up. So... I was eating meat off the, not off the street, but like from uh, street vendors, like little barbecue sticks. I was, I was eating everything, a lot of street food. Back then street food was more of a thing. And, um, but now I know like what to avoid and what will work for my stomach and what won't. So that was the most difficult thing for me in the first year. I had like four different bouts of awful food poisoning in the space oh. of a year. So um, yeah, culturally, I don't know. I I never, I never felt like a huge sense of culture shock. Um, oh, okay. So uh, I, we have another question here, um, which was a super chat, but I, I missed it. I'm very, very sorry about oh. this. Um, so he's curious um, when we think that China will open up again. He's doing a studies for the fall, but frightened he won't get in for 2021 neither. I have no idea. Do you have any idea? I I estimate probably yeah beginning of next year or like winter I maybe. Thrilled. I would be thrilled if I could be at be in China early next year. That will be a huge win. Um, yeah, I don't know. I th I reckon things will start to really open up after a vaccine has come out. Um, I can't see that there's going to be a situation where China wants to open itself up to countries that don't have like a con a con containment on the virus so yeah um i don't know maybe they'll open up a bubbles like travel bubbles i know that um australia is talking with a lot of other countries about opening a travel bubble because australia has a low rate of this um virus so true that would be an opportunity um to go abroad i don't know what the deal would be for the u.s though um yeah, it's hard to say. I don't have any, like, insider knowledge, unfortunately. Um, I check the news every day for any kind of news, but unfortunately I just, I'm not holding my breath on it. I'm just, it'll, what will be will be, and I'll, yeah. Sorry, I there don't have go. a better answer to the question. Um, hobby, yeah. Um, um, I have a question here for you. What age did you start learning Chinese? Uh, 24, 24, Tw 24. I learned like my first Chinese ever. So nice. You got yeah, in was... just under the 25 mark. I heard that up to 25, <laughs> your brain changes in some way that makes it harder to learn languages. Um, I can believe that, but I mean, like, it, I don't know. I, I feel like people can also use that as an excuse, you know? <laughs> Like I'm yeah. sure it's harder the older you get, but um, yeah, it's I've loved the journey even well into my well early thirties. Yeah. <laughs> Are you thirty? I'm thirty one. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. How about our next comparison here? Um, let's have a little topic about social life um, when studying Chinese in China and compare university like making friends in a university context compared to going out and making your own group of friends um did you find it hard to make a group of friends when you were studying uh, like alone uh, like what was your experience with making friends and the social scene uh i don't know i mean i've never i've never had trouble making friends but i found that it's harder to make chinese friends for sure compared to uh compared to Western friends, you know? I mean, Westerners just sort of have 
uh, a more similar style of partying, I guess, you know, compared to like Chinese who it's more yeah. activity focused or there, there's like gotta be a game involved, but foreigners are more about just kind of chatting. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah like, um, I think it, it, it's always natural that you will, um, go towards what you know and what you're comfortable with and definitely the um the temptation was really there for me to just hang out with the people in my class and because in the unit when you're doing university classes and you're doing like something like an exchange um exchange or an intensive language program you make so many friends like it's probably the most social time of my life um being in university in china um but yeah if you do like it is a and almost like a really hard decision to like actually say no I'm not going to go out tonight with the western crowd with my um English speaking friends and you know make some new um connections and at first it is different and but I found I got used to it really quickly and um I I always enjoy spending a, a fun night out with my um uh, my Chinese friends over hot pot or some <laughs> um, some street food <laughs> yeah it all focuses around uh, eating for us. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fan of hot pot though, and I know that's a big that's a big thing. And you're like, what? No, I'm just not a fan of hot yeah, pot. There's so much choice. You know, you can put whatever foods you want. <laughs> you can get even just like a plain soup, and then put whatever sauce you want with it. Like, wow. Oh. Anyway, I respect your. I respect that. Everyone has their likes and dislikes. I've just never met anyone before that doesn't like hot pot. You've, you've honestly never met anyone that doesn't like, maybe you've met people that have lied to you, okay? Because I I know a group of people that are close to me that don't like hot pot. But what's not to love? <laughs> it's, I you, look, I go to a restaurant. I want someone to prepare the, po the food for me. I don't want to cook it. I don't go there to pay someone to give me food. I got to oh. cook myself. So it's the manual labor element that you're not a fan of. Yes. So you don't like Korean barbecue either? I'd, I'd prefer t for someone to just bring me a bibimbap. Like, I just don't mm. like cooking. I'm, I go to a restaurant to avoid the process of cooking. <laughs> just, Fair uh, enough. You know. <laughs> sorry, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm so passionate. I've had this conversation before and I'm like, I'm always ready to talk about hot pot. It's very, it's very enlightening for me. I've actually literally never met anyone that doesn't like hot pot. So, um, wow. yeah, I've learned a lot from this conversation. Um, <laughs> can you, me? someone's asking, can you handle the spice? Oh yeah. I can handle the spice for sure. Spice is, is my friend. It's, it's the manual labor. Oh yeah. Know. I guess, um, do you, because you come from Texas originally, do you, did you just put sriracha on everything when you were a kid? Uh, I guess. I mean, sriracha is not really that spicy, though. But uh, oh, I really? didn't really, yeah, I didn't really start liking spice, though, until I was in China. China kind of uh, is what brought me up to level. How about you? Are you a spice lord? So, um, I'm having a bit of a love-hate relationship with spice at the moment. I overdosed, funnily enough, on spice when I <laughs> I came back to Australia and I was um, eating a lot of spicy food in China, so I wanted to eat more spicy food in Australia. And I started making uh, chili oil and it was delicious and I, I was putting Sichuan peppercorn on everything and I got to a point where my stomach literally couldn't handle it anymore and I was just eating way too much spicy food. And then it was like my stomach one day decided to just be like, no, no more spicy food. And it spent like a good month or two recovering. So now I feel like I'm going to get back into it again. But there was like oh. a two month no go zone um, when it came to spice for me. Um, oh, man. Sorry to hear that. I first. I was having way too much spice and Sichuan peppercorn. Um, yeah, fun, fun story for everyone out there um so a question uh what would you if you could do it all again what would you do differently in terms of um studying chinese in china do you have anything you would do differently um i probably would have i probably would have taken a route more similar to yours honestly amy i i like the university route i like that regimented way of studying yeah. as a way of entering into china um, yeah. and that's why I like, I feel like my first year there, I was like, man, I didn't spend enough time studying. 
Uh, I, yeah. I thought that I was learning enough sort of through osmosis. And it wasn't until I started meeting my friends who studied at university that I was like, oh man, like you can't compare. Like people that studied at university that just started from and built that really strong foundation of writing, reading, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I had a lot of catching up to do. So I would probably copy you, honestly. But like keep in mind with a university, like an intensive language program, you are in a situation where you can get a lot out of it or not much out of it at all. Like there's not a huge amount of discipline. And as long as you just pass barely, you're fine. Like, and actually you're not even, if you're just on a normal, if you're paying for your classes, you're not even required to pass. I think if you're on a scholarship, you need to get at least 50%. But you can either study super hard after every class, go and memorize your vocab, and in which case you will come out of it super strong um, because you're really soaking up everything you can out of it. But, you know, on my second semester in my intensive language program, I found myself getting really zoning out in class, sitting at the back, not really paying attention. And as a result, in that semester, I wasn't, I didn't really improve too much. So I'd say that keep in mind with, when it comes to university classes or classes in general, you can you get what you give. Yeah. yeah, you get what you put in. You get what you, what you get what you put in. Um, yeah. Um, if I was to do it all again, I would, I don't know. I wouldn't say I would do anything differently. I, if I go back and study again, like next year or something, I would go to a smaller city, but I don't regret spending a year in Shanghai. Like I freaking love Shanghai so much and I loved living there. So I don't want to take that experience away, but I definitely do want to have the experience of studying in a smaller um, city for a longer period of time. Um, yeah, yeah, that's probably the only thing I, I can think of right now. I, I wouldn't say that I've like, had, you know, I've, it's been a long process and my Chinese definitely is not perfect. So I'm not sitting here being like, I did it exactly as it should be, but <laughs> the experience and things that I was able to do because I followed that path. I'm like really happy about that. Yeah. Um, and now for our last question before we move on to maybe some questions from the, the chat um, is if we can compare um, what it's like studying Chinese in your home country um, compared to studying Chinese in China. Um, do you have any like thoughts? How do you, how did you go about learning Chinese in your home country? Uh, I mean, I never studied Chinese in the United States other than uh, online through Omeda, yeah. the private school that I've yeah. uh, worked with over the last year. So other than online classes, no experience. Would you say that there's like an environment that you can go into and f like speak Chinese or like, is there any way of getting that Chinese speaking practice or a Chinese environment when you're in um, like where you are now? Is there any way that you could go about that? Uh, I'm sure pre-COVID there there were chances for me to do that, but I don't know about right now unless I like walk into yeah. some Chinese restaurant and just annoy the staff, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I guess like one of the big differences between studying Chinese in China and studying Chinese in Australia is that you just don't have that environment and that osmosis, that environmental factor every day that you're picking up words from the you know, that you hear on the street. And um, I think that's a big element in learning a language, you know, to that next level of fluency when you're surrounded by it every day. Um, I started learning Chinese um, in Australia for two years at university. And I think um, people might think, oh, you know, I'm going to major in Chinese studies. I'm going to come out of it fluent. But I can definitely say that two classes a week like three hours of Chinese classes a week is not enough to like get you to any kind of level of Chinese level. Yeah. And I ended up going, to, I ended up going to um, China uh, on my third year of learning Chinese and not being, knowing how to order a glass of water um, at a restaurant. It was so embarrassing. And people are being like, Oh, like, have you just started Chinese? And um, so yeah, I would say that if you have the opportunity to do so, um, go to China as soon as possible and do some kind of language course, whether that's for a couple of weeks or a month or six months or a year. Um, I would say it's really, really valuable in just helping with your listening skills. 
Um, but to say that if you are interested in learning uh, Chinese in Australia or in the US or in your home country, there are environments that you can push yourself to have that Chinese environment around you. Uh, lately, I've been visiting a awesome uh, tea shop in Sydney, and um, once a week, I've been going and uh, speaking with the the shop owner. I sit there for like four hours. We have debates in Chinese about like the other day we were talking about the difference between if you're Buddhist and you see a piece of meat which is made of plants, would you be more likely to eat that, or would you be more likely to eat? Um, a plant that looks like a plant that's made of meat. Anyway, it was this big philosophical discussion wow. um, in Chinese, and I came out of it being like, oh, yeah, it feels like I was just in China for the day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there are definitely ways to go about getting that um, immersion, um, even in your home country. Um, generally, I would say it's a lot easier learning Chinese in China than it is in the West. Would you agree with that? Like, do you feel the uh, motivation to there's, in your Yeah, there's absolutely no question about that. Like, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> there's no way to argue against that. Absolutely. You got to yeah. be in China. You got to be there. Yeah. And I was talking with Quajo last week, two weeks ago, we, we did a live together, and he was saying um, a really great um, way to study Chinese when you're in China is just every day when you're catching the same train that you catch every day, that character that's on the carriage window there you're seeing it every day may as well memorize it so yeah. i feel like when you're in china you have a lot more opportunity to pick up characters that you're surrounded with in your environment totally. um, and yeah and also when you're there you're confronted with a lot of other chinese speaking foreigners and i have real jealousy when it comes to people who speak chinese better than me i'm like oh my god oh. like i'm so jealous and how yeah, can i push too. myself to make my chinese as good as you and like probably the fastest rate of um, Chinese uh, progression I ever had was when I was doing this Chinese language competition surrounded by amazing Chinese speakers. And I was like, I need to study my butt off to like feel anything near their level. So yeah. Um, yeah. I completely um, agree. Yeah. It's, it's good to be around other foreign language learners because it makes, yeah. it, it makes me so competitive and I'll spend hours studying by myself just to be like, Oh, well, this is just, you know, normally, Oh, that character. Oh, but you know, what's funny though about Chinese and this, like everyone who studied Chinese has to relate to this because I feel like it's one of the, the specific things about learning Chinese. There's this particular yeah. language, no matter how hard you study it, no matter how much time you dedicate yourself, you're going to encounter that situation where you're with a friend and they're going to be like, hey, what does this character mean? And doesn't matter. You studied for 20,000 hours, but you're, that one character, you've never seen it or you just forgot yeah. it. or And you're like, I, I don't know. And they're like, oh, and it's the worst feeling. Like, oh, dude, <laughs> I swear. Yeah. I know everything else. I I know, but yeah. I don't know that character. Oh, it's the worst feeling. Yeah, like there are so many characters in Chinese. I'm never gonna like beat myself up about not not knowing all of them. Um, <laughs> like it, yeah, the basic one. I'm happy when I can read like a read a sentence without um not knowing one character in it. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I I feel people ask me the question, "Are you fluent in Chinese?" And I oh, don't know how to answer. Because I feel like the more you learn a language, the more you realize you're not fluent. Um, so I don't think I'll ever consider myself fluent. But for some, well, no, no, there one, is there is a really easy way to answer that. I think. Yeah. You're you're fluent in as many characters. Uh, well, I guess that's kind of a okay. Like if you're fluent, say you've like studied up to HSK five, you're probably fluent in around two thousand characters. You're not, you can, you, okay. you're fluent in the way that like an eight year old is fluent. You know, it's, you're not. Yeah. I guess there are different, I guess your definition of fluent changes as you learn the language more. So if I would show my, like my 18 year old self, me speaking Chinese right now, I would say as an 18 year old, oh my gosh, future me is so fluent in Chinese. Yeah. But listen to myself right now I all I can hear is the mistakes and the wrong mispronounced tones and the way at how much further I have to go um yeah. so I'll probably see myself into if I could see myself two years from now and the kind of Chinese I'm speaking I'll be like oh my god I'm so fluent 
probably yeah. in two years from now, I'm like, oh no, it's horrible. Uh, what a jungle twig bula. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, it's no, the no. unavoidable, but yeah, I think just being able to communicate and have a, have a chat and get around is, is a nice level to be at. Um, yeah, but I definitely want to improve more and be able to feel more like one day more native level of Chinese. Whereas right now I still feel like a five-year-old. Um, yeah. But yeah. But I feel like, I feel like most foreigners are fluent for about 10 seconds. You know, everyone gets that like 10 second sort of circle of fluency where it's like, oh, Nisha Nadiran. Mm -hmm. And you can answer those oh. questions like, oh, yeah, no big deal. Oh, well, Dajun was Sanyanla. Like, you can answer those questions. You're like, yeah, 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 okay. And then they they ask you that one that you've never heard and you're like, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely like those. Um, and that's the thing when you're learning Chinese in China compared to when you're learning Chinese in Australia, there are sentences that you pick up and you can practice those simple foundational questions when you're in China. Like every time you get into a taxi in China, they'll ask you, or like if you start a conversation, they'll ask you, where are you from? What are you doing in China? What do you like to eat? Like those simple exchanges, you really get to practice a lot more in China compared to Australia. Like you can study from textbooks all you want, but are your taxi driver, are you even catching a taxi in the US or Australia? I know I yeah. sure am not because I would be broke in 15 minutes um, after yep. a taxi ride. You don't have those everyday conversations and you, you're not building up those conversational skills. So I think that's a huge difference between studying Chinese in China and studying Chinese in your home country. Just having those everyday simple conversations that over time build you up and up and up so that your fluency in those conversations you're comfortable in become um, more and more comfortable. Um, yep. But yeah, I'm trying to do my best while I'm here. I'm definitely making studying Chinese a priority. Actually, um, something I want to shout out is that uh, this weekend, if you're in Sydney, anyone watching this from Sydney, I don't know if anyone is watching this from Sydney. If you are, please comment in the comment box. Um, I am going to be doing my first ever Sydney meetup and I want it to be a place where everyone is welcome and a place that you can come and speak Chinese and make some new friends and um, have a good chat. So um, if you're interested in learning more about that, um, let me know. Um, it's going to be at 10 a.m. in Hyde Park in Sydney. So I would really, really love to see you there, anyone who's watching this. Um, and, yeah, hopefully planning to make this more of a long-term thing and make like a Chinese corner where people can come, have a good Chinese chat, make some new friends and practice their spoken Chinese rather than spend all their time at home. Um, now that restrictions are lifting, I think it's a good opportunity to do that. So anyone who is interested, uh, please come along. Dang, I wish um, I could come. That's well, you know, maybe you can in two years when the <laughs> when you can travel again. <laughs> oh, crazy times, crazy times. Um, well, the, that's the end of our questions um, that we had prepared for ourselves today. Um, I'll give it a few minutes to see if there's anyone in the chat who has any questions, and oh, uh, hey, we can. Oh, I did see. I did see a question that someone asked that is something that you and I talked about briefly. Um, yeah. but that we never got around to, uh, someone asked like, is it helpful having, uh, having a Chinese girlfriend would definitely help. Um, oh, yes. yeah, this is something that, um, I think that, uh, it really does help. And I think that generally speaking, it's, it's an advantage for Western men because typically you don't see many Western women dating Chinese men. And so like. I think that as a resource for just practicing in your daily life, you know, mm -hmm. if you're spending all of your time with someone, um, you're going to pick up so many more subtle things and nuances. And so uh, as someone who has lived with a Chinese girl for like a long period, that definitely helped my Chinese. But a criticism though for that is it helps only to a, a a point because like you're not living with a teacher who's like trained to teach you you're living with like a mate you know what i mean yeah. and like they see how you communicate and once they understand they're not going to correct your every mistake and so it might in fact reinforce mistakes so yeah. there are certain areas where i would make mistakes and my girlfriend never corrected me over months and then i'd speak with other chinese friends who would be like oh uh, no it's this 
And then I go to my girlfriend later, like, I've been saying it this way for so long. She's like, well, yeah. I knew what you meant, so I didn't. And I'm like, you got to correct me. But but that's yeah. also not her responsibility. So yeah. Uh, so there's exactly. pros and cons for, for dating someone who's Chinese for sure. Yeah, so you become more fluent but in the wrong thing because yes. you keep saying it that way and you become more and more fluent in this like <laughs> – Yep. quasi Chinese kind of weird combination. Um, exactly. I have a really funny story from um, when I was studying at um, at Tsinghua. I had a friend who was um, uh, speaks English, and I think he was from Amsterdam. And he had started dating a girl from Korea who spoke no English, but they were both learning Chinese um, in like a begin slash intermediate level. So they actually had their language language was Chinese, even though neither of them spoke Chinese particularly well. So listening to them communicate was honestly the most interesting, fascinating thing because they weren't speaking it properly. They had like developed their own kind of language. Oh because man. They would use Chinese, but in a wrong way, but that would keep getting reinforced because that's just how they would communicate. So they could have really good discussions, but their Chinese was all over the place. And yeah. I couldn't figure out whether that was um, actually doing them good or not so good. Uh, but, yeah, I well, definitely agree that having a, yeah. a partner um, native, native Chinese would be a really good <laughs> resource. So just uh, on the point you're talking about with your with your friends using Chinese as a bridge language, think about yeah. all the people in the world whose second language is English. Like I know people yeah. who's like who are French who meet yeah. uh, like a Chinese wife and yeah. or like some like I know I'm thinking of someone specifically and their second language is both English. Think of all the yeah. people who communicate in English and it's both of their second languages. So yeah. as strange as that is to have people using Chinese as the bridge language, it, mm -hmm. you know, we're using the lingua franca. You were so used to yeah. it, but so exactly. many people have to use it in order to facilitate their own relationships. So, you know, I give yeah. them credit, you know? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually, I haven't really thought about that before. Um, I guess it must be really hard for my boyfriend. He's German and his second language is English and communicating <laughs> must be a lot more difficult um, because he's not using his mother tongue, but thankfully his English is quite good. Um, and we don't does have it, any major speak Chinese. No, no, uh, he's actually learning. So he's using the app. Hello Chinese. I think it is to learn Chinese, uh -huh. but he learns like a word a week. So um, <laughs> he's making progress and he can say like some basic stuff, like, the other day he was like, what the mall or neither go ne like my dog, your cat, like he's learning like the what the mall is. Um <laughs> but yeah, um he's making some progress. Um uh, bless him. Um let's see if there's any comments here. Um question here, what's the easiest way to make Chinese friends? I would say um, join a, a sport, do a sport or an extracurricular activity, an art class, a cooking class, something that forces you to go somewhere once a week with the same group of people. And you'll make relationships um, if you do that for long enough. Um, yeah. Do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, just to cost people on the street, grab them yeah, and just <laughs> ask for their WeChat. You always see my... Uh. Oh my gosh. Um, there's another question here. Can we talk about living in China, uh, pros, uh, pros and cons? Um, there's so many, uh, this would be like a topic of its own, a live stream of its own. Um, yeah. How about we each give one pro and one con? Okay. Hopefully you don't take either one of mine because I'm, I'm thinking right now. Okay. I'll, I'll give mine first then. Okay. Pro of living in China, different food every day. Food is like, yes, the first thing that comes to mind. Um, a con of living in China is having to use a VPN to get onto uh, Western social media. Um, your turn. Wow. Okay. That was fast. You put me in the hot spot. Uh, pro of living in China, B, having a finger on the pulse of the world's fastest growing economy. I love that Ooh. about it. There's just so what much going on there. That? You know, but it's so true though. Like I just feel like everything is so slow here that yeah. I'm like, man, I want to get back to China. Uh, con, I was going to say the same thing. Slow internet. 
I love how fast the internet is here. Oh, I would say the opposite. I miss China's fast internet. My internet is so horrible here. Oh, which is, man. I don't think it's really blurry, but I don't think I'm anywhere near as um, clear as you are right now. Um, well, I guess, uh, you know, American internet. That's one thing we got going for us. <laughs> oh, fake news, fake news. Um, <laughs> um, there's another question here. What's the top three foods to try in Beijing? Mm. Uh, Peking Jam duck. Oh, but that's not a Peking food. That's not a Beijing food. Uh, I mean, you're right. It's a, it's like a, it's a Tianjin food or a Shandong food, but yeah. they have it in Beijing. Yeah. Okay, okay. So Peking duck. All right. I would say jajangmyeon, one yeah, of my jajang favorite mian. noodles. And number three, I would say it's not technically a Beijing dish, but since Beijing is technically in the north, I would say chunbing. I love going to chunbing with friends. Have you mm. had chunbing before? I don't know. I don't it's super know if I've had chunbing. So like Peking duck, the concept of Peking duck, where you have these um, like wrappers, yeah. and then instead of just having, having one – filling like the peking duck you or and you go with a big group of friends and you order like five or six different dishes so you might have one that's like egg based and then one that's saucy meat and one that's more veggie based and then you basically put all different combinations in your little pancake put, put that poisony kind of oh sauce. yes yes okay duck. yes yes and I have. so it's like it's basically like peking duck but more variety and yeah. um it's technically not Beijing, a Beijing dish, but as I said, Beijing is in the north, so. Okay, all right, yeah. so then, so, okay, yes, I have had that dish, and it is amazing. I do yeah. love that dish. Yeah, um, Aussie internet is slower than Slovakia. <laughs> yeah, probably. My internet is so bad, yeah. I like that guy's um, profile picture. Yeah, it's cute, huh? The screaming anime <laughs> face. <laughs> um, do you know Beijing well? Beijing. Have you? Do you know Beijing well? Like, have you spent? Much oh, do I know Beijing there? well? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been there three times. Like, I guess I know it kind of well. Yeah. Um, because yeah. there's a question here about like the best place to shopping in Beijing, but I could answer this, but I don't think you could. Um, <laughs> San Lutun. That is would be one of my uh, top choices. Um, that is a good shopping hub. Um, uh, I would also say. Uh, San, wait, San Lipoir. San Lipoir, um, as the Beijingers would say it. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I have discovered a love of shopping in Shenzhen. Um, it's got some of my favorite malls in the world. In the world, um, Shenzhen has so many malls. I could give you a list of like five different places to shop in Shenzhen, but I haven't done much shopping in Beijing in a really long time. But yeah, you have a, like a main street in the middle of um, right next to Forbidden City. Actually, um, I forget the name of it. Would, would I forget the name of the street? But there's like main street um, right in the center of Beijing. That's good for shopping. It has all like the the usual suspects. Uh, anyway, let's move on to another question. I'm not answering that very well. Um, <laughs> this is a very appropriate answer to that question. Oh yeah. Well, it's. Yeah, okay. Taobao, best place ever. Yeah, Taobao is a good place to shop in China. Um, yeah. Oh, Wang Fu Ding. Yes, that's the name of the place I was thinking of, Wang Fu Ding. Mm. They used to have this uh, this street food street uh, where you could go and eat, like, the insects and stuff like that. I'm sure you probably have been there, maybe. It's yeah. quite a tourist site. But they've now closed yeah. it down. Um, the last time I went, no more food street, which is really sad. Oh, man. Um... Let's see. Are there any questions here that you see that you would like to answer? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we've oh, been at it. Please help us help our friend here. Because she speaks Chinese and I can't kindly tell her how to approach her. All right. Go hard. <laughs> <laughs> Go hard. Can you give him some tips on what to say? Like something nice to like a, a floaty sentence? Um... I would just, man, you know what? You don't want to be so direct. I would just ask her how her day was. You know, you just want to show some concern for her well-being, you know? 
uh, get to know her. Just ask her as many questions as possible. You know, you want to get to know who she is and let her know you're interested. And uh, if she always comes back with responses, she's always willing to talk to you. And uh, also use emojis, right? But not too many. And uh, yeah. yeah, emojis. I, um, I came across a um, an account on Instagram that had a really fun post about flirting in Chinese. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I think it's this one. And it had like three pages of, oh yes, it's um by China Simple, China Dot Simple. Um, and there's a whole post about flirting in Chinese. So um, I guess you could get some good, some good tips from that account um, about how to go about getting this girl's WeChat. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, we might end on that note. Um, just before we go, thank you so much to Blink for your super chat. Um, yeah. Any closing remarks? Anything you'd like to plug? Um, where can people go follow you? Um, so yeah, you guys uh, over on Amy's channel, thank you so much for watching. And um, yeah, my name is Kevin Cook. All of my channels, I guess I just do YouTube and Instagram, everything at Monkey Abroad. So yeah, check me out. And Amy? And you have a new channel as well. I have a what? You have a new channel. Oh, yeah, I mean, that? I, eh, that's, uh, I'm not going to plug my new channel. I'm just making really stupid content over there. I fact, really I'm enjoy it. I'm trying to keep that channel private, so why don't you? Oh. No, I'm. I'm just joking. I'm mean, probably going to get even more interest now that you've said it's a secret. Um, that's a really <laughs> good strategy. I'm going to take a leaf out of your book. So everyone on Monkey Abroad's channel, everyone on Kevin's channel, my uh, my channel is a secret. Only very special <laughs> people can follow it. Um, it would be very hard for you to find. So don't even try. Um, don't but even yeah, try totally with the name, with the name, like, wait, right here. It's <laughs> right below her name, her face. Uh, such a secret. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed this stream. I hope that we provided some value to people out there that are thinking about studying Chinese in China or people who are studying uh, Chinese in general. Uh, let's do this again soon. I had a really good time. Yeah, me too, Amy. This was a really great little live stream. That hour and I... 37 minutes flew by. Yeah, now it's time for breakfast. I'm thinking about uh, the wheat bix waiting for me downstairs and my coffee. Ooh, nice. High fiber coffee. <laughs> That's all right. Well, it, <laughs> better. Uh, well, yeah. all right. You, you would get it. I'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's it for today. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, yeah, stay safe. Uh, be well, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.